shall we say, the opening uh, 20 psukim or so, 20 verses, almost finishing the chapter. And we talked about tumat mate, the fireman to the dead. We learned how unusual, how we don't understand anything. We saw three things that have to be thrown into the fire of the red, the burning of the uh, the red heifer, the uh, the eres tree, the eres a, a, a wood of the cedar tree, the azov the hyssop or the zatar bush, which is a uh, spice, and number three, a thread of scarlet. We read the instructions. We read the the laws. We added some oral Torah to it, of course. And some of you uh, were a bit perturbed. What does this mean? What does this signify? What's behind this? And the teacher sitting at the same chair that I'm sitting here refused to reply. You noticed he was a dammit. He refused to reply to the answers, to the questions of the good questions that are being asked. And today we're going to treat it for a certain amount and open up and say, it's really a mystery. Okay? Our parsha begins with the red heifer, probably the most mystifying subject that we have in the Torah, taking a red heifer, burning it, its skins, its flesh, its bones, its dung and everything. And one of the greatest men of the Jewish people in history, the wisest of all men, called Shlomo Melech, the writer of one of the five Megillot called I'm purposely look look at me. If you look at me, I'll look at you. No. It's on the board. Which Megillah? In parenthesis. Oh, Kohelet. Kohelet. Okay. okay. In Kohelet. You'll excuse the poor penmanship. They call it in Latin. Ex I, don't even, I can't even pronounce I can't even pronounce it. It doesn't make a difference. Shlomo HaMelech okay, says in Kohelet chapter 7, Amarti Ech Kema. I said to myself, meaning I'm going to get some wisdom by studying the matters of the red heifer. But he says, Vehu Rechoka, Vehi, should be a printing mistake, Vehi Rechoka Mimani. But this section of the red heifer, it's so what? I can't understand it. It's distant. It's far from me. In other words, as the Midrash says, Shlomo HaMelech, who succeeded in understanding the entire Torah, but once he reached the chapter, chapter 19 of the book of Bamidbar, and he reads about the red heifer, he probed, he investigated, he researched and questioned, and he thought he can get some wisdom from it, but he was wrong. It's so far. Rechoka mimeni. None of us sitting here can pretend to say, well, I understand the red heifer. I know exactly what it's talking about. I think we witnessed this yesterday by the good questions that were asked. What is this symbolizing? What is that symbolizing? And so on and so forth. And the truth is, will briefly bring to our attention when Rashi finishes his commentary on the chapter. Turn to the end of the chapter, please, if you can find it in your chumash. Keep your, let your fingers do the walking. See where you end the chapter and get to verse 1. Everyone look for themselves. Where is the end of the chapter? Okay. Yeah, get to the end of the chapter. See where a new chapter begins. Everyone look by themselves inside and see where verse 1 begins so you know that's the end of the former chapter. Okay? How many verses is this chapter, gentlemen? 22. 22 verses. Okay, excellent. And now, that's the end of the chapter. If you look below your linear line, Rashi, after verse 22, does something that he often does not do. And he says, Umidrashe Agada. Do you all see that where I'm pointing to you for those that have Rashi? What page is it on in your linear? 
199. Thank you. So Rashi down below says, Umidrashe Agada. You know, I'm going to bring you Agada literature of the Midrash. Mi Sodosh Rabbi Moshe Darshan. And then, in a very lengthy way, Rashi brings the Midrashic understanding. In other words, he ignored it until now. He knew that it would be bothering some of us. What does this mean? What could it be symbolic of? To what is it a metaphor? We're not going to get into it, just a few points. For instance, on the word Aduma, red, Rashi says in the name of Isaiah that a sin is metaphorized in the color red. In the color red, you see that Rashi? And then Rashi goes into many matters that the red heifer is the reaction, I mean the reaction to it, the atonement for it is the burning of the red heifer, taking the ashes. And the erez, the cedar tree, represents what part of sin? When a person's attribute is of such that he has so much self-pride, talks so much about himself, every third word out of his mouth is, I this, I that, me this, and me that. And Rashi says, well, that, le that leads to sin. A person thinks he's in control, I this and I that. Whereas a zov, another thing thrown into the fire, the hyssop, the zatar, some say it's even the oregano. The Ezov, which is a very small bush, indifferent to the Erez, the cedar tree, which is so high, that represents humility, that represents modesty. Two extremes. Just like fire, the ashes, then mixed with water, two extremes. Rashi says here, that a person has to lower himself, submit himself before the greatness of Torah, submit his attributes before the call of God, the greatness of God. So you see here, as an example, there's Midrashic understanding. It doesn't mean that we really understand what's going on. I want to just share with you for a few minutes and this a type of approach, allegory, a metaphor, Written by the great Sforno. Okay, and written by the great Sforno. Where's the Sforno from? I thought so. Okay, in the 1400s, right? Was it the 1300s? Okay. He writes in his great commentary, okay, in this great sefer that I have published by the Mossad Rav Kook edition. I have the text on top, as you see. And I have not in Rashi italics, but in printed, regular printed letters. Almost all the classic medieval commentators like Rashi, Ramba, Nachmanides, Forno, the Chizkuni, eh, Eben Ezra, Nachmanides, and so on and so forth. And we'll just treat a bit. I saw that uh, the great commentator, Mrs. Rabbit and Nechama Leibovich, she brings this Forno. If you want to try to see a more allegorical approach, a metaphor, she, he writes this, this Forno. He says this, the crux of the mystery <clears throat> of the mystery is I put on the board mitameta tahorim and second line mitahereta tmeim <clears throat> English David mitahereta mitameta tahorim what does that mean? Um, I, I meant the first of it. Me? Yes, you. Uh, <laughs> rest, you take a rest of Purifying the... No, mitame. Mitame. Oh, making impure. It imp makes impure who? Impure. The pure. The people that are pure that deal with this become... Impure. 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 Defiled. Whereas the second sentence... Mitaher. And it purifies who? The impure. Does that make sense? Whoever deals with the red... It makes sense? It's a, it's a contradiction. It purifies those that are impure to the dead, and it imp, imp, impures those that are pure. The one that slaughters it, the one that burns it, we learn, and, and the one that collects the ashes, all of a sudden they become tamay. 
they become tamei. The one that's burning, the one that's slaughtering, the one that's collecting the ashes. They are tohor, and they become tamei. Whereas you sprinkle the ashes on someone defiled to the dead, they become pure. Doesn't make sense. Okay? That's the mystery of the para aduma. He, he says, let's look at the three things thrown in. We said the a piece of wood of the eris tree, the cedar tree. We said the azov, the hyssop with the zatar. And a, th and a scarlet thread. Scarlet is the color? Red. red, red. red. We know Isaiah says, Yalbinu chata'enu kashelak. He talks there about the famous pasuk uh, that a, th a sin is likened to the color red. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Why red? You ask yourself why red? Uh, uh, our friend uh, Ravid, who's moving apartments, he's not here for a few days perhaps, he asked the question, what is the significance of the red? Our prophets used red. It's a very strong color. I have Avram over here. He works the laundry mat. He has the, all the professional washing machines. The toughest color to take out is what, sir? Red. There you go. He has experience. Red is a very strong color. Yet when you do tshuva, when we want to mend, change our ways, our actions, our behavior, our speech, even if it's likened to the color red, what can be done? King the Isaiah the prophet says, there shall be white as snow. Yalbinu chata'enu ke? Snow? Kesheleg. He shall bleach, you shall bleach the sins like snow. So the redness signifies a strong color that in the real world, it's very hard to launder, to clean, to scrub, to take out. But here the Torah is saying, parad duma, the fact we're throwing a red thread into the fire, it's expressing the ratzon of tshuva, of repentance. That if we do want to repent, we can. And as if when I did become Tamei, impure, I know you didn't do a sin. Who's the only one in Am Yisrael that has to be careful not to be defiled to the dead? Oh. Incorrect answer. All Kohanim. The only one. Okay, the only one entity, thank you. The only entity commanded, as it is in Vayikra chapter 23, Parshat Emor, quote, Lenefesh lo yitama be'amav. Repeat those four words. Lenefesh lo yitama be'amav. To a dead person, you cannot defile. That's the Kohanim. So, the, there's an analogy here that even if we become tomatoes, as if we did a sin, we don't really do a sin. But you know what? The red thrown into the fire is bearing us in mind that the Torah says if you want, you can do tshuva. Even if your sins are like red, they can be scrubbed, they can be atoned for. Furthermore, the, Sfor the, the Sforno says, <clears throat> the always know, like the Rambam says, to be exceptional, to be extraordinary, extreme to the right, overdoing things is not good. Not indulging and not doing things, being extreme to the left, is also not good. Rather, the Rambam writes, and the Sforno also writes, what method of Judaism should we approach? Balance. 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 The medium. They call it the golden approach. Okay? Dera Shvila Zahav, the golden way. And therefore, the Torah is recommending the golden means because all extremes are un undesirable. And the Sforno says we can see metaphorically here to gain the middle way. Sometimes, as the Rambam writes, you have to go to an extreme. If you want to balance yourself, sometimes you have to go to another extreme. The cedar tree symbolizes the pride. The hyssop, the azov, is just the opposite. Do you know, when you learn about King Saul, 
and he didn't give enough self-dignity to himself. When he was crowned, we studied this in the Haftarah here last Thursday afternoon. When Saul was crowned to become king, he didn't make anything of himself. That was too much humility. There were people that bad-mouthed him. There were people that didn't support him. Instead of going to, the, to, to, to be living as if in a palace, he just went back to his own farm. Too much undignity is not good as well. And they, therefore they say that Saul was punished for not caring for his own dignity. And therefore we're seeing that maybe if you're not dignifying yourself, you may have to go to the other extreme in order to get to the middle. That's how the Rambam often suggests. And therefore, it could very well be that maybe the para duma is teaching us with all opposites, water and fire, the hyssop and the cedar tree, that we have to find the middle way. That's maybe metaphorically what maybe could be explaining to us. Your two short questions. Okay, um, I thought it was very interesting that um, the para duma is like the service is performed outside the temple. Um, is there like a reason for that maybe? So we said it's not a korban. We mentioned this yeah, yesterday that the place for slaughtering the paraduma, we mentioned yesterday, is where? Outside three machanot and facing east or west. Slaughtering, it says, towards the Oal Moe, meaning from the east to the west. When we have a temple, as the Mishnah teaches us in the tractate called Para, the slaughterer will be on Mount Olives, mm. on Mount Olives, and the blood will be thrown towards the east, the, towards the west. Otherwise. Your question? Yes, uh, the color red, um, I can see a lot of uh, stories where uh, we know about red, like for example, Esau being red, red. Rachel, <laughs> Zerah, with the hand, with the red. So red, you're saying, is also symbolic of... David Hamelet being red. Okay, okay. It's it's, it usually symbolizes blood, th blood, action. And now we can use this bloodthirsty matters for being a shochet, or God forbid, violating and murdering, or so on and so forth. But the redness here, this foreign is bringing, is what Isaiah talks about, that it's as, as if representing sin, and it can still be bleached, it can still be atoned for. But yes, there's other, there are other metaphorical understandings for the color red. What, Amos? My question is, did we, didn't we say that he, those are not uh, people with sin, but they are unclean, just like the unsterilized? There's no doubt that we don't see in the Torah that if you are defiled to the dead, you're violating a sin doesn't say that. I'm just saying, maybe this one is saying, metaphorically, it's related to, but we see that Chazal, para duma, why para? Ah, it's coming to atone for the sin of the Jewish people in the, the golden calf, the chet ego. And he sees this, you see that in the Midrash. But, but, yes, sir? Also, it's also like a connection also with the Torah itself with life, like keeping Torah, it's like the tree of life, so not keeping Torah, it's like you dispatch yourself from life. So you can say... So, so if you're connected to death, you're away from life. You can't do some things of the Torah. Very good point. There's no doubt that if I am default to the dead, I can't walk on certain places of the Temple Mount. I cannot eat. Korbanot, meats of sacrifices. If I'm a Kohen, I cannot eat. What's that wonder bread called? Truma, right? And so on and so forth. You're right. I want to say the following. A famous story in the Midrash, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. You know the story. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was the leader of the Jewish people as the Romans are coming to destroy the temple. And a non-Jew, idolater, comes to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and says, excuse me, these, this ritual that you guys perform with the red heifer, <laughs> it smells like witchcraft. We mentioned this briefly yesterday. You bring this red cow, you burn it, you grind it, you take its ashes, and then you, <laughs> you sprinkle a few 
drops on one of you is contaminated to the corpse and you say to him, you're now pure? Hey, buddy, this looks like witchcraft. Is that what it is? Jewish witchcraft? That's what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was asked as the Midrash tells. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai answers him, have you, Mr. Gentile, have you ever been possessed by a demon? No, never. Have you ever seen a man possessed by a demon? Of course, yes. What do you guys do for him? Oh, we take herbs. We smoke them beneath the person. And then we th throw some water on him. And you know what happens to the demon? Poof! <laughs> he is... Obliterated. He's obliterated. He is exorcised. He is removed from the area. Ah, Mr. Gentile, let your ears hear what your mouth has spoken. Okay? The spirit of defilement that we have is the same as your demon. We sprinkle on it the waters of purification of paraduma. And then what happens to the demon? It goes away. That's the end of the dialogue between Rabbi Yochanan ben, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai and that non-Jew. The students were in the area and they heard the dialogue. Rabbi, is that what you said to him? Have you just put him away with a straw? I mean, just easily you, 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 you met him go with, with such an explanation? What about us? What answer will you give us, Rabbi? And Rabbi Yochanan, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai replies to him, by your life, don't understand that. The dead, not the dead defiles, and not the water purifies. But a Kadosh Baruch Hu said, Zot, next word of the parsha, Zot, Chukat, HaTorah. Zod Chukat HaTorah. Turn to the first Rashi. Rashi brings a famous Gemara Mesechet Yoma. Have you, you all turned to verse 2? Yes or no? Which page is it on? Thank you. So Rashi says, I'm reading the Rashi down below. Lefi Satan v'umot olam monim et Yisrael omar ma mitzvah zot. Meaning, Evil spirits and the nations of the world are taking action to the Jewish people. What is this mitzvah about, you guys? What's, what's going on in your Torah? What's the reason behind it? Lefichach, therefore, katavba, therefore the Torah wrote which word? Chuka. You and I know that a chok is what? Is a what type of law? It's hard to understand. A statute that has no human rational understanding it's a decree next two words of Rashi you have no permission what? very good it's a decree that I have decreed and you the Jewish people you are not authorized to violate my decree you're not authorized to criticize or try to understand this decree. My dear friends, this very important Midrash is opening a very important window for us. The Torah's devilement, can, the heathen, the non-Jew, he required a rational explanation. Because you have to give him something that will appeal to his common sense. As if this mitzvah is like a kind of disease or this mitzvah is like an evil spirit. And that the red heifer is no more than a cure for a disease. That's what he explained to the non-Jew. It's, we, you, we put it in a spray, it's a, dem, it, a demon repellent. <laughs> it's a repellent. You just spray and it goes away. But Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai tells his disciples, students of Torah, students of Torah have all malchut shamayim. They have the yoke of heaven. They have the belief of the God of Israel. And therefore, when we're studying that it's a chok, 
Tum'ah, this uncleanliness, it's not part of a natural process of our world. The, na the nature of a corpse, or in the one who's coming in contact with it, this is not the laws of nature. Because if it would be the laws of nature, it would have human rationale. It would have common sense. Your father always told you, things have to be common sense. Things have to be rational. John Dewey, things have to be pragmatic. I'm sorry, we're told our world is not common sense all the time. Our world is not always rationale. So Tuma and Tara is not a demon. It's not a pest originating matter of the corpse. And therefore, as Nechama Levich brings in this wonderful article on this famous Midrash, she says, based on what our Chazal are teaching, that the ashes of the red heifer and the waters of this semi-korban, it's not a korban because it's really, it's not brought onto the altar, they have no intrinsic purificatory properties. There's nothing based in water or the dead. Rather, this is all a divine commandment. That alone, the word of God, he's the one that's determining this is defilement. He's the one that's determining this is purification, his words. Because we know, as King David says in Psalms, that the Torah refines the human soul. God forbid for the people that think that our Torah is a medical book, a book of medicine. God forbid, now we have a little short opportunity, gentlemen, to deal that through paraduma, what is the nature of the mitzvot? Are the mitzvot a... Is my penmanship that bad? Are the mitzvot a emtsai, a means? Or are the mitzvot a tachlit? What is tachlit? Objective, purpose. Again, are the mitzvot only a means? Or are they a purpose? Now we're viewing what really what Torah is about. And we're learning, you know what? Nachon that here the Torah calls this particular mitzvah chok. But as we mentioned yesterday briefly, there's a dimension of the Torah that all the mitzvot of the Torah are like a chok. I know you may understand not to bump into someone's car purposely and not to throw a banana peel on the floor so God forbid you're creating a bore. And I know there are things that are logical. There are mitzvot that are meant, that. Are, that, are that. But the very service of Torah, the service of Avodat Hashem could lead you to think mistakenly, like nations, Gentiles think. Two different ways to think what are the mitzvot. There are nations in the world that think, ah, I know why you guys don't eat a, a pork and cheese sandwich. I know why, because you think it's very unhealthy. It's very unhealthy to you. Okay? There are people that think that if you keep the Torah, my life physically will be a better life. I'll be more organized. I'll do these mitzvot. It's the approach of Torah. It'll allow me to have much more successful thinking as if the Torah is a book of medicine, a book of remedies. We have a very complex world. We have situations which are very unsimple. I'll, I'll keep the Torah and the mitzvot have a better type of a life, more order. Can the approach of Torah is to allow our lives to be more successful, just like a book of medicine is. The Rambam pushes this aside. What? Are you relating to mitzvot as if they are a what? Emtsa'i? Are you saying the mitzvot are a means for life? What? These mitzvot that come from God? The Almighty of the world? Are you saying they're only a means to life, that you have a better life? Is that the reason why God brought down the Torah and the mitzvot? Ah, you're putting up a mezuzah, so you're going to be secure in your house. Is that the reason for mitzvot, that they are a means? The Rambam writes, the Maral of Prague in Tiferet Yisrael, in the glory of Israel in chapter 8, also writes the same thing, he brings the Rambam. He says, that's a chilul Hashem. 
That's a desecration. You're taking holy things, a mezuzah, tefillin, talit, a shabbat, a paraduma, which is kodesh. They're holy, these actions, yes or no? And you're saying that the Kodesh is a means to have a better life, to have a more healthy life? The Kodesh is a means for the Chol? For the mundane? Just the opposite. What? Shabbat Kodesh. Oh, now I'll have physical strength for Sunday. I'm resting on Shabbat, so I'll be strong. That's, you're, you're undermining. You're lowering. You're making the mitzvot a means. I'm sorry. The mitzvot are kodesh. We don't use something kodesh for a means for something else. The opposite. The Torah and the mitzvot are refining us. The Torah and the mitzvot are bringing us to cleave unto God, to be attached to the seichel of God. The Torah and mitzvot belong to God's intellect, to His intelligence. By connecting, by performing, by reading the Shema, doing the mitzvot, we're doing divine actions. It's not a means for something of uh, my life will be now better physically and so on and so forth. So we're learning now that the Torah itself is something which is holy. Don't look for rational explanations. You could, but you should know that that's not the bottom line. There could be something rational behind so many mitzvot. That was the search of Sefer HaChinuch. That's an argument in the Talmud. Can you or not interpret the reasons of the mitzvot? Certainly God didn't give it, except for very few. And according to that approach, that you can, but we should always know that there's something beyond it. There's something holy that it's divine. And therefore Rabbi Yochanan preferred to move aside that Gentile and give him a rational explanation because that's only that's what they can only understand. But something that's related to the metaphysical, which a chok is, and that's a certain dimension of the Torah, there is no other understanding. We're related to the divine. We're, we're, we're doing things that are making us divine, related to God, to his sechel eloki. We're getting to attachment and cleaving to the, un, the infinite. By doing these finite mitzvot that have time, place, what to do? We're, re we're being related to the infinite. The greatness of the infinite is that he's revealed in the finite world through Torah mitzvot. And now we're being cleaving on to God. That's it for today, gentlemen. Shalom.